Uh, I'm Carrie Poirier, and I've been asked to moderate this session. Uh, one of the points that the keynote speaker made this morning was very interesting and very important, and this is a good example of it. Initially, during the early years of urban renewal, right after World War II, there were very limited strategies and goals for urban renewal, largely to improve housing stock, and oftentimes that was achieved through large-scale demolition. And so there really weren't many different ways that you could spend money. And these uh, two presentations are going to, to reflect on the broadening perspective of how federal and state monies could be used and to leverage um, different goals, not just wide-scale demolition and a focus on housing, but a larger focus of revitalization. So we're going to be looking first at how the state used the uh, strategy of establishing urban uh, heritage parks for key cities in Massachusetts, and as well as the older uh, strategy of the National Park Service. So, we, and both of our gentlemen presenters are our gyms, so that's, this could get a little, little redundant. <laughs> okay, good morning everybody. Uh, my name is Jim Shane. I'm the Visitor Services Supervisor at Lawrence Heritage State Park. Been doing that since uh, 1998. Um, I was also born and raised in Lawrence, although that's too many years ago to go into detail. Um, but I have a presentation for you about uh, the history of Lawrence Heritage State Park, which is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. We opened in 1986. Um, and so it's a time to look back and see what was done and whether uh, it has served its uh, purpose, or I should say purposes, because the heritage parks were created with many uh, purposes in mind. And uh, I will read them off of our brochure just to make sure I, I get them all in. Uh, about Massachusetts Heritage State Parks. The Heritage State Park Program is a national model of urban environmental design, historic preservation, and economic revitalization. Established in 1978, the parks celebrate the city heritage, encourage private development, bring people into downtowns, and create urban spaces for the whole community to enjoy. Uh, well, that's quite a, uh, quite a menu of uh, objectives there. Uh, Heritage State Parks have been established at Blackstone River and Canal, uh, Fall River, Gardner, Holyoke, Lawrence, Lowell, Lynn, Roxbury, and North Adams. Um, so that's what we're about. I'm going to uh, start a little bit of the park program, uh, statewide program in general, and then talk about Lawrence specifically. So let's see how our technology works. No, it goes this way. There we go. Um, so in 1976, Governor Dukakis, who remembers Governor Dukakis? Who's the old timers in there? All right. I, I have him to thank for my job. So. Uh, Governor Dukakis signs a bill designating portions of downtown Lowell as the state's first official heritage park. 1976, uh, interesting time. Uh, I point to the fact that that was the bicentennial and there was a lot of interest in uh, history and particularly an emphasis on local history. Uh, but of course the bicentennial was celebrating uh, the American Revolution and independence 200 years earlier and places like Lawrence and Lowell didn't really take part in that because we didn't exist at the time. Um, but it did generate some interest in the local history uh, even that wasn't related to uh, the revolution. And in 1980, the Massachusetts legislature approves an act authorizing the state to take over and develop areas in seven more cities as heritage parks, Lynn, Lawrence, North Adams, Fall River, Gardner, and Springfield. Um, oh yeah, and my, my double asterisk, this was two years before Lowell National Historic Park. So there, <laughs> Mr. National Park. Uh, <laughs> Um, and that brochure that's depicted there, the Massachusetts Heritage Parks, is this here, um, which is actually more like a booklet. It's pretty extensive with a page or a two-page spread on each of the parks that's being developed. And at that point, Lawrence Heritage didn't quite exist. And the page just features this uh, beauty shot of the mills and the sunset colors reflecting off the windows of the mills along the North Canal. Um, so, what happened in Lawrence? 1980, 
uh, we have the first Bread and Roses Day in Lawrence, the first public commemoration of the strike. As some of you know, for decades after the strike, it was considered a shameful episode in Lawrence history because of the role of the uh, uh, IWW, the radical union that uh, organized the strike, and it was a suppressed memory locally for six and a half decades until finally in the <laughs> late 70s, uh, new, uh, more favorable interpretation of the strike came about and a uh, young uh, city administration of which uh, Ms. Poirier was a part uh, saw fit to celebrate this history of the Bread and Roses strike taking place in Lawrence. So we had our first Bread and Roses Day on the Common um, with, uh, we had two-thirds of Peter, Paul, and Mary. Uh, there's Mary there. Whoops, that's the wrong button. This is uh, Mary Travers of Peter, Paul, and Mary. Um, not a tremendous affair. A couple hundred people came out for this event. But it was a landmark in uh, folks locally being interested in celebrating our history rather than being uh, ashamed of it, ashamed of the decline after the mills had closed. So uh, state comes in with the Heritage Park program, working with the city, uh, working with uh, certainly City Hall, the mayor's office, uh, Senator McGovern, who was a state senator at the time, played a major role in uh, in putting this partnership together. Um, and there was a committee of 10 people, I believe, uh, local people who were very much involved in the planning and development of the park. So it wasn't a completely top-down, state-down project, but was done with the cooperation and input from uh, Laurentians on the ground. Um, so people like representatives of the mayor's office, of our historical societies, and others participated in the planning. Uh, the first big project was improving Canal Street because uh, it looked like this uh, back then, and uh, you see it's a rutted dirt road. Well, there's actually brick and some pavement and there's trolley tracks or train tracks down there. Um, and uh, when I look at this picture, I really uh, uh, admire the vision of the people who said, we're going to make this an attractive place that people are going to want to come to. Um, but it took a lot of work and a lot of money. So here's, uh, here's the guy who signed the checks, uh, Mike Dukakis at uh, Canal Street announcing a groundbreaking or some of, the, uh, some of the development that was taking place down there. And uh, of course, it was a lot of work to turn this uh, and this into this, uh, Canal Street as we know and love it today. Um, that is looking east. This is looking west. And this is the Canal Walk. In addition to the street, we created this. Um, I say we. I wasn't working at Lawrence Heritage at the time. Um, but the uh, Department of Environmental Management, uh, which was the state park system at the time, we have since merged with the MDC to become DCR, Department of Conservation and Recreation. Um, so it's a walking path along the entire length of the North Canal, about a mile long from Union Street all the way down to Broadway, um, you know, where Lawton's is. Um, so it's now it's a nice place for a concert along the canal or a little festival. So moving on. I can't have a Heritage Park without a visitor center. Uh, the, it is the focal point of the park. It's what a lot of people think of when they think of the uh, Heritage Park in Lawrence, although in fact we also have about 80 acres of green space spread around the city, um, some of which is not recognized as state park property. People think it's, uh, these are city parks, or some of them anyway, but uh, part of the mission of the Heritage Parks was to provide green space for recreational use in some of these old, dense, old, uh, industrial cities in Massachusetts. So that, that was part of our plan too. But the visitor center was this. Some may recall Feezy Sales, a wholesale outlet. You want to buy some cheap tobacco, candy, party favors, stuff like that. Feezy Sales was the place to go. Uh, Feezy was short for Fizzichelli, the family that owned the business. 
um, in what was uh, one of the original boarding houses. And we'll, we'll see that, how that looked in a second. But here's the other side of uh, Fizzy's sales when the state took it over in the early 80s. This is how it looked in 1912 when the strike was on and the militia was marching on horseback down Canal Street. Um, we also see a stately row of trees along the canal. Of course, you, that didn't exist in the, uh, in the 1980 picture with the, uh, the, the rutted dirt road. And of course, it was, it was such a handsome building, it made a nice backdrop for this photo of the militia on horseback posing in front of, uh, in front of our, uh, our building. So, whoops, I'll get the hang of this. So after a few years and a lot of money and work, uh, this is what the exterior looks like. This is what it looks like today. Lawrence Heritage State Park Visitor Center at the corner of Jackson and Canal Street. Um, inside, what did we do inside? It was this bare space. Uh, had been a boarding house for the first uh, 40, 50 years of its existence, but it uh, had been simply uh, you know, more or less warehouse space for the last 70 or 80 years. Um, so again, a lot of work required, uh, fixing up the place, installing exhibits, and then opening day, Labor Day, 1986. Who's there? Governor Dukakis. God bless him. God bless him is right. Um, and his, uh, oh, is Kitty there? No, Kitty is in this photo. Um, 20,000 Rediscover Lawrence, Immigrant City Opens Its Arms. Again, opening day, Labor Day, uh, 1986. Happened to coincide with the first large-scale Bread and Roses Festival, and it was all part of a vision that, you know, history, uh, Lawrence's history is number one, something to be proud of, and number two, something we can use to uh, improve the city. Uh, to capitalize on in terms of redevelopment, reinvestment, and just generating uh, civic pride, which, which had been on a pretty low uh, level in the years leading up. Um, so, yeah, we've got, uh, uh, boy, we've got the governor and Mrs. Dukakis, uh, then Mayor uh, Kevin Sullivan, young mayor, um, but of course, here in Lawrence, it's often very hard to get a clean victory. So, of course, below the celebratory headline, it says, youth dies in stolen car. Mm, oh well. So, opening day, people uh, enjoying the exhibits. Uh, it's beautifully designed uh, exhibit on the history of Lawrence on the first two floors of the building, um, which was designed by uh, uh, museum design group based in Boston, I believe, um, although again with a great deal of input from local historians um, who were able to uh, have a lot of impact on the way the story of Lawrence history was told in the museum. Um, again, the exhibit. It looks kind of posed picture. These are not uh, candid shots. All right, up on the third floor, there's two more important spaces in the visitor center. There's the community room and the gallery. The community room is a fairly large space uh, where any number of events are held. It's, it's quite a busy place. As uh, Mike, the park supervisor, can attest, weeks like this, we're uh, seeing a lot of people coming in and out of the visitor center. Um, Back in the opening, whoops, I keep doing that, okay. All right, you know who this guy is, right? That's, that's Dukakis. Um, getting kind of tired of him, aren't you? Uh, it's a ham. And here is the visitor center, uh, the community room rather, during one of our many popular events that are, that are held up there. And then there's the gallery. Here he is again. Uh, and a nice exhibit in more recent days in the gallery. It's a beautiful space where we have rotating exhibits, mostly local organizations uh, putting on their exhibits there. Uh, currently, by the way, for the month of May, we have an exhibit of art by members of the uh, Point After Club in Lawrence, which some of you may know, so please do check that out. I'm, I'm an employee of the Point After Club. 
Really? Okay. How many people came for the opening yesterday? Like over a hundred, like yeah. Next, uh, green spaces. Uh, we have right next to the visitor center. Uh, back then, we had this lovely uh, uh, edifice here. Here's the visitor center, and it's it's open at this point. There's the new doors we put in, um, and the deck. Uh, but right next to us is this remnant of the industrial age. There had actually been another boarding house on that site. The original boarding houses were in a double row all the way from Union to Broadway. But once the uh, original workers, the Yankee Mill girls, got replaced by the uh, waves of immigrant workers, uh, the mills got out of the business of providing housing because, of course, they didn't care what housing the immigrant workers had. Um, so the boarding house system faded away. There were actually only two boarding houses left at the time that uh, the Heritage Park came in. And the other boarding house is at the corner of Amesbury and Canal Street, which is where the Central Bridge crosses. And that was considered as a possible visitor center, but rejected because it's such a busy intersection, you wouldn't want a lot of pedestrian uh, traffic around there. Um, so, but next to our building is, was this, um, back view, side view, and the other side, which shows the big G for Genesque Bakery. It was a warehouse for a commercial bakery that was across the street, and inside uh, they had, uh, these must be giant cans of flour, I don't know what other thing a bakery uh, would need. But that's what it looked like inside, and this is what we did with it. Um, gutted it, exposed uh, the beams, but took the roof off um, for a lovely little garden park called Visitor Center Park, which now has uh, wisteria. Well, the wisteria's not in bloom yet, but come back in a couple of weeks. Wisteria's growing across the beams. It's a great place for events like a three-legged race, or a little festival of local culture. Pemberton Park. How about a nice big green space right by the river with views of the mills and the dam and so on. So we took this space, which is right next to the central bridge, um, and of course was the site of one of the major mills. This is where the uh, Atlantic mills were located for many years. But the Atlantic was one of the first I'm sorry, the Atlantic was one of the first mills to go out of business because it had concentrated in cotton textiles and the cotton industry in New England went into decline in the 1920s. So the Atlantic mills went out of business in the 1920s um, and in order to build this uh, very large bridge, the third bridge crossing downtown, uh, much of the Atlantic mills was torn down and eventually it was all virtually all torn down. There's a little bit of it left. Um, so we built a park down by the river. It's only about four or five acres, um, but now it looks like this. Beautiful spot. Suitable for Bread and Roses Festival concert, kite festival, nice things like that. All right, now we're moving into the late 80s. And as you may recall, the 80s were uh, locally considered or characterized as the Massachusetts miracle. Uh, Massachusetts economy was going great guns, much better than the rest of the country. Um, and that certainly helped the whole Heritage Park uh, program. The fact that the state economy was doing well, uh, state government was doing fairly well and could invest the kind of money that it took uh, to create all these developments. Now this last development um, is more on the art front. Now Ralph Fazzanello is a great uh, people's artist uh, uh, painted uh, originally uh, a union organizer and then he became a painter first in New York then he came to Lawrence painted our history, contributed to the revival and the revision of the story of the Bread and Roses strike back in the, when he was uh, here a lot in the late 70s. Um, and so it seemed appropriate that we should have one of his paintings of Lawrence history. So this painting, Lawrence 1912, the Bread and Roses strike, um, was available for purchase through a program called uh, Public Domain, a friend of Ralph's uh, had talked him into 
this program to make the paintings available for purchase and display in public venues because he's a people's artist. His art should be where the people can see it, not in some uh, you know, rich guy's penthouse suite. Um, so this painting was available for the low, low price of $100,000 and through a combination of uh, donations from business, labor, private individuals, and some state money, the painting was acquired and dedicated at the park in 1988 and it uh, hangs now in this very prominent location in our uh, in the lobby as you come in, one of the first things people see and uh, really is our pride and joy. Now, Bob mentioned uh, early on that he wore his, his city tie today and I forgot, I have a Fazanella tie but I forgot to wear it. Um, but it's not from one of the Lawrence paintings so that's okay. Okay, let's create a big park, Riverfront Park uh, in South Lawrence where there was a city park called Riley Park which was uh, pretty run down by the 80s. It also had a uh, city pool in it that was run down, defunct and closed and growing an impressive collection of weeds as you see here. That was called the Alicon Pool. Um, so the state comes in to redevelop it. Oh, also in that area was uh, the Greater Lawrence Community Boating Program, GLCBP, and circa 1979, they were operating out of this lovely uh, shed. Um, so, state comes in, and uh, we're, we're past the Dukakis era, by the way. You see Governor Weld on the sign here, okay? Um, and Riverfront Park is developed. It's a 47 acre, I believe, uh, park with public boat ramp, playground, uh, grassy knoll, um, tennis court. That was a street hockey court, but it's mostly soccer now. Um, basketball court, trails through the woods, uh, the woods where Robert Frost romanced his future wife, Eleanor. Um, trail along the river that leads to the new boathouse. A little better than the last one. Um, the Greater Lawrence Community Boat Boating Program is a nonprofit partner of ours. Uh, they operate the boating program, they own the boats. Um, but we own the building and the grounds and, and kind of share in the maintenance. It's a complicated but uh, positive relationship. Um, but we do own one of the boats. This we fondly call the barge, which we use for tours on the Merrimack River. Uh, finally, the last edition, Workers Place at Pemberton Park. Now, uh, I mentioned the Massachusetts miracle, the great economy we had in the 80s. Well, that came to a grinding halt uh, starting around 1990. Uh, the economy uh, nationally went into recession and certainly Massachusetts uh, shared in that and the state budget reflected that and the parks budget reflected that. So staffing went way down from the original staffing levels, um, has never fully recovered to the staffing levels we had for those first half dozen years. Um, and so no new additions took place until the early uh, 2000s when uh, State Senator Sue Tucker, another champion of ours, saw some old yellowing plans for an addition to uh, Pemberton Park and said, you know, maybe I can find some money uh, in the state budget for this, uh, which she did. And so we added Pemberton Park, and that's uh, Senator Tucker, the lady in red here, at the dedication of uh, the Workers' Place extension of, uh, of Pemberton Park. And that is a view of Pemberton Park as of Thursday. Sorry, I couldn't get a sunny day this week to go take pictures of Pemberton Park. And uh, view of the river in the, in the front section of the park. Finally. Uh, smaller but uh, lovely addition to the park properties, uh, the Bicknell Clock. The Bicknell Clock was a street clock that existed on Essex Street in Lawrence in front of a men's clothing store called the Bicknell Brothers or something. Um, and here's the clock in a wooden frame uh, in which it sat behind our visitor center for the first five years I worked there until the Friends of the Park and the Historical Commission decided that you know we're gonna take this bull by the horns and get this uh, clock restored uh, which they did 
So here's the clock restored back in Lawrence, um, being fondled by one of our dear friends of the park. And here is how it looks now in front of the visitor center. So it's a beautiful addition uh, to our properties. So what's new in the neighborhood? Has all this accomplished its goal of furthering revitalization in Lawrence? Well, right across from us is the uh, Washington Mills, which was still a raw industrial building for the first few years where I worked at the park, but for the last eight or ten years, uh, it's been converted into a beautiful uh, uh, loft apartments. There's about 160 units in there, and it's 100% occupancy most of the time. Um, a little uh, further east along the canal, uh, we have the Union Crossing development, which is a multi-mill uh, mixed-use redevelopment, and the final phase is this building here, um, which was the duck mill um, originally. Some uh, old timers in Lawrence remember it as Zippolitos, a furniture uh, store, but now it is being uh, restored as the last phase of the Union Crossing development. Um, and then to the west, directly to the west of us, is the Lower Pacific Mills, which are currently being redeveloped as another mixed-use development. Now this mill building is the one that faces the canal, uh, but there are actually, there's another building beyond it and buildings behind it. It's a huge mill complex um, that is kind of going to be redeveloped. And oh, which by the way happens to be where my grandfather worked as a machinist for 40 years. So, uh, we'll end with the uh, sunset over the canal and the lovely colors over uh, in the windows of the Washington Mill. And I look forward to your questions later. Yes. And before there were the idea, or was the idea, of uh, state parks, in state urban parks in Massachusetts. Uh, it's really the federal government that had pioneered uh, the use of urban parks. And uh, Jim O'Connell from the National Park Service will be talking about the experiences in Rome, New York, and Providence, Rhode Island uh, for the National Park Service. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Jim O'Connell. I uh, work in Boston. Um, and I work on national parks, play in national parks throughout New England and New York State. And I'm going to give you kind of a different take on urban renewal from what we've heard earlier because it's often thought to be something to create better housing um, or, or a whole range of things. In, in this case, I'm going to show you urban renewal, so it was thought of as demolition but to create historic parks, such as Jim was talking about, but really knocking down uh, historic buildings to create a place that then will attract people to the place. Now, I'm going to talk about Providence and Rome, New York, but I'm going to start with a couple major cities. This is a smaller cities conference. But I just want to show you a couple things from a couple bigger cities. How many people have been to Independence Hall in Philadelphia? Okay. Well, here it is, Independence Hall in 1950. Oops, oh geez, I've already lost it. How do I get it back? Oh, here we are. Um, there it is. And this was created as a national park in 1948. This is, and as I said here, there's kind of a civic myth to Philadelphia, right? The birthplace of American independence, the Declaration of Independence, U.S. Constitution were uh, created and signed in the Independence Hall. This was a museum going back to the 19th century, but by the mid 20th century, Philadelphia was an old aging city and they wanted to not just turn into a national park, but create a big area around it. So here it is, 1950, and then in the next few years, in the early 50s, they tore down all this here, which really isn't colonial era, it isn't American revolutionary, and it kind of comes down like this. And you can kind of see by the 1960s, here it was this big mall. And they thought that they had to get rid of this old 19th century city. It was dirty, it was falling down, the buildings weren't up to code, and you wanted to have a big breathing space. They always had this 
Independence Hall, a little park behind it, some other historic buildings, but the idea was to create this place where people could go and understand and appreciate the history of our country. And here we are, here it is, I'm just kind of giving you a sense of what urban rural is like. After World War II, 1950s, 1960s, into the 70s, the idea was if it's old and obsolete, get rid of it. By the late 70s, historic preservation really kicks in and that isn't likely to happen. So here you go here, they're tearing it down, what I showed you from the air, and here you can see this mall taking place. I'm gonna whiz through Philadelphia. I wanna show you St. Louis, the famous Gateway Arch. I'll flip ahead here, I'll show you the Gateway Arch, oops. The Gateway Arch being built. I don't know, has anybody been to the Gateway Arch in St. Louis? It's, it's really cool if you get there. It's 600 something feet. Um, here it is down here, and it's a fantastic ride. Um, but I want to show you how it comes about. You know, St. Louis was an old river city. You know, here it is in the 1930s, the Depression, which really wasn't a great time for American cities. Between these bridges here, it was all oriented toward the river and river traffic, but by this time, cars are coming in. They want to get rid of the old city. They want to bring in highways. And you can see they wanted to create a park here. They wanted to create a park along the Mississippi Riverfront, celebrating, again, as I said, the civic myth of St. Louis is the gateway to the west. You'd come down the Ohio River, the Mississippi River, and then you'd go, maybe go into the Missouri north of there. Lewis and Clark went out of there. And this was the jumping off point to discovering the American West. That's what they wanted to celebrate in this decaying city in the 1930s and the Great Depression. So they said, let's go in, and they tore it down. They demolished it with some federal funds. These are WPA, which is Work Progress Administration. That's the New Deal. PWA's uh, Public Works uh, Administration funds, some city and state. And they demolished it. Look at that. Big, big swath. And you can only imagine what was here. What, maybe really interesting buildings and historic fabric, and they just tore it out. So here we are, 1942, but it's World War II, so they can't do much with it. So, so it takes them a while. They finally, by 1947, the design competition, and this Finnish American architect, Eero Saarinen, has supposed to do this really cool gateway arch. Yeah, I don't really get to show you the whole thing, but I know you've seen pictures of it. And you can see the whole riverfront is kind of demolished and taken away to create this park. And it takes, actually, it isn't finished for 20 years because they couldn't get the money. That's the interesting thing about all these projects, um, whether it's uh, in Lawrence or historic projects or national parks. I was just in an interesting panel on uh, Lowell. These things do not happen overnight. It takes a lot of savvy, a lot of intelligence, a lot of resources, incremental, a lot of feedback from the community. So it takes a long time to do this. So I'm just kind of showing you how these, let's say here, here's a highway coming in. And the whole idea was to kind of forget the Mississippi uh, working waterfront and create a park. So now I'm going to get to what I'd like to talk about, which are medium, smaller size cities creating national parks to reflect the civic myth of that particular city to celebrate it. So here we are. Uh, this is Roger Williams National Memorial in Providence, Rhode Island. And there's a lot to see in Providence, Rhode Island. It's, it's got a lot of interesting architecture. Has anybody been to the Roger Williams National Memorial? There really isn't much to it, and you're going to see the story in a minute. And that's the way it is. It probably makes Lawrence look like a fantastic park, but I'm going to show it to you in a second. I just want to show you what the park looks like. I'm going to flip through. I'll come back in a second just to show you what the park looks like. Wait, oh, I have to go. See, I didn't want to wait till the very end. It's basically this four and a half acre space in the middle of Providence, Rhode Island. Um, but the idea is to celebrate Roger Williams, who was the founder of Providence in 1636. And he was very famous for, I'm just going to come all the way back here. He was very famous for being the first person in America to say that church and state should be separate and that the government shouldn't tell people what religion to belong to. If there was an official religion, it should be up to their conscience how they wanted to worship God. And he was the first person to do that. And he's really always been celebrated in Rhode Island as this founder of Rhode Island and this very important person in American history. Kind of his ideas going into the Bill of Rights in the U.S. Constitution. So here he is. Here's a picture from the 19th century. It's kind of a, I don't know, goofy picture. He's meeting the Indians and then meeting them with the peace pipe. It's kind of romanticized, if you will, but kind of the image 
that they have in Providence, Rhode Island, about what's really most important and significant about their country, uh, their city and state. So here you are, this is the site as it is today. I'm gonna show you, gonna show you a lot of different pictures. This is kind of urban renewal from the ground up, um, just how it plays out. So here it is, here's this four and a half acre site. Now, you know, I've, I showed you other national parks to show you Independence Hall, which is really elaborate, because there are other buildings as well, Carpenter's Hall, et cetera, the Betsy Ross House, Benjamin Franklin's house site, and St. Louis's big gateway arch. And then you think of other national parks, Grand Canyon and Yosemite and places like that. This is a national park. There are 410 national parks in the country. This is a national park. Uh, just like the others, four and a half acres, maybe it's like a little urban pocket park, maybe like you have here on the riverfront, and it has a little 18th century historic house here, kind of telling the story of Roger Williams. <coughs> here we are. So here I'm gonna show it to you from the air, and here's the Rhode Island State Capitol, here's I-95, and here's this big Providence Shopping Mall, which is kind of an active place if you've been there, and here's the railroad station. Here's Brown University and Rhode Island School of Design, and here's our little Roger Williams National Memorial Park right here, created by Urban Renewal. Now, they're going back to, here's a recreation, I don't know what it really looked like, in uh, when Roger Williams lived here, what his house would have looked like, and this is the way Providence would have looked in 1650. And this is on the land, and they ended up coming here because it was a spring where you could get drinking water, and that's what they wanted to celebrate. Because there was nothing left from 17th century Providence in, by the 20th century. Uh, no buildings, nothing. So how do you celebrate Roger Williams? So they had this spring, right? And there was this wealthy uh, local uh, businessman and donor, Jerome Hahn, um, and he, with the money, kind of bought up where the, there were some buildings around there, had them torn down just privately, had this little park created, this little pocket park. Here's the stone, and here is where, like a little fountain, where you could kind of drink from the original spring uh, in 1933. And he gave this to the city. So, okay, so what do, we, what do we do with that? So then, you know, as we've heard today from all the speakers, American cities after World War II were really struggling, all of them, center city, you name even places uh, in the Sun Belt, like San Diego, their downtowns were all being abandoned, people were moving to the suburbs in the 50s and 60s. So cities were kind of desperate to come up with a lot of ideas how to keep, keep people in cities and bring them back. So here you are, here's our little place I showed you from the, oops, wait a minute. Here's our little place right here. Uh, here's where the state capital is, railroad lines. And this, is, this whole area here was ultimately torn down. Here's the little Roger Williams Spring Pocket Park and this other little park, this Burnin Park for another guy. It was kind of funny, back in these days, individuals um, who had made well, wanted to give something back to the city so they would have an ancestor. In this case, the Burnin family took on a little parcel and they kind of gave a little park. So these two odd little parks right next to each other. And you can see all these kind of 19th century buildings. So here I'm gonna show it to you from a different angle. Here's the state capitol, which is a magnificent state capitol. Here's the railroad line. If you're going from Boston to New York, you come down this way. And then here we are again, here's our little area. You can see the buildings that were all going to be demolished. And here's the site of the spring before um, Han kind of turned into a park. And this is where the Burnin Park was. So you can kind of see this incremental thing. How do we create some green space in our town? So this is a 58 study, but in 1957, the city of Providence came out with a big urban rural plan. This was their plan. And their whole idea was to tear down all the old 18th and 19th century part of Providence. And they were going to tear down this whole area of Benefit Street, which is all these fantastic houses which are still there. And a lot of people in the city said, this is these some of the greatest buildings, most historic parts of Providence. You can't tear it down. So they didn't, here they kind of said, we're not just gonna tear it down. And they forced a study. They forced a study, a new one the, the next year um, to preserve a lot of the historic buildings on the south, on, I'm sorry, 
I've got to get it right, the east side of Main Street, but demolish the west side, which we showed you. So Providence is kind of saying, yes, we should do some historic preservation, but there's a lot of these 19th century buildings we should get rid of. And they created a, this group before here in 1956, the Preservation Society in Providence, one of the oldest preservation societies in the country like this. And they created a very early historic district that preserved 500 of these buildings, a lot of which, which would have been destroyed. And 75 historic buildings were restored in a period of time. So they're kind of getting onto it. Let's restore the good stuff and maybe get rid of the not so functional stuff. So this is, so here's, here's the play in 1959. This is what they were doing. This is modern design, modern architecture. People don't always think of the 50s. The 50s, a little bit of the 60s, were very, very modern, very clean lines. And this was their plan. Again, on the little parcel that I've shown you. So here's the parcel from the side. This is green space. This is green space. And in the middle, here's this little plaza. And here's the design of the plaza. They'd have this little walkway across the street. And here are this kind of like concrete plaza and a little pavilion, I think, here and here. And then here, the kind of, and I'm going to show you in a second, to take this colonial house from another town and drop it in here. It had nothing to do with Roger Williams, but they said, it will look like Roger Williams. So this is how we'll do it. And then they created this very modernistic thing, right? So this is what they wanted to do in 1959. And here's the house, Johnston, Rhode Island, about 30 miles away. It was built in 1691, and they wanted to drop it in there, but it didn't work. People said, hey, wait a minute, you are not going to do that. We want it in Johnston. Today it's owned by Historic New England, a major organization, and you can go and you can visit it where it was originally built. So here I'm showing you again. This is the renewal plan as it's coming together. Um, this is the plan by the 1960s, and this is kind of driving where we are. Here's the little spring park, Roger Williams Spring Park. Then they had a little bit of stuff here, and then this little Burnin Park. Then they had this gray house, which dates from 1730. We're going to keep that, but then we're going to demolish the rest of this here. And these are the buildings which they were originally going to demolish. All of these here, and the, the people in the city said, hey, wait a minute. You're not going to do that. But this stuff here is more commercial, so we'll get rid of that. So here we are. This is one of the buildings. This is what they're demolishing. It just gives you a sense of what was there when people were trying to renew their cities. And this is a real interesting thing. This is a building that dates from the 18th century, but it had been kind of boosted up. You can see this was originally the front door, but somehow they had put over time something down below here, and it's kind of a 19th century thing. But they tore this down. They got rid of that. It's kind of next. And here it is. By the early 70s, they had cleared the site, and they had taken this one historic building. I'll show you the other picture. The, this is the house from the 1730s, the gay Antrim, gray Antrim house. They moved it from the corner, moved it in here. They got rid of all this stuff. You know, here's the downtown, here's the railroad tracks, here's the state capitol up here to the right. And this is what they had. And this is the kind of, to really celebrate. And here's this house, though it looks like it's kind of new. It was built in the 1730s, the Antrim Gray House. This is a visitor center. This is the only place you can really go in and get the story. They have some displays, a little film. It says who Roger Williams was and how his career and teachings were very important to um, freedom of conscience and people to, to, to believe what's important to them uh, in, in religious terms. Here we are, here's a range of program in this little park today. And here is looking toward the downtown through the park. And this is the spring built in the 1930s. So that's kind of the Rogerius Park. You know, I'm a, I love the national parks, but this is certainly one of the least uh, impressive examples that we have. But this was very much pushed by the city. The city and the US senators, they said, we want to bring something home to Providence, we want to bring a national park into town. You can see what they did in Philadelphia. You can see what they did in St. Louis. They got real, um, uh, real resources. Uh, the case here in Providence, there wasn't really anything left of anything having to do with Roger Williams. His Providence was completely, had completely disappeared. So this is how they decided to memorialize it. It's a memorialization, not uh, anything else. So let's see what else I've got to show you. So now I'm going to bring you to a place that probably you aren't familiar with at all, but it's a very interesting story. I'm just trying to kind of put out the different models. And these are parks that I have worked on, by the way, done some planning for. Fort Stanwix National Monument in Rome, New York. 
Um, just to show you where Rome is, here's the New York Thruway coming from Albany to Buffalo. Rome is more in the east between Albany and Syracuse. Um, and I'm going to give you the story of Rome, New York. Um, Fort Stanwix, do I have a, well, uh, you don't have to get too hung up on this, was a very important place in the American Revolution. There was a big battle there in eight, uh, 1777. Uh, to give you just a little thing about the American Revolution, the British troops were going to come in and invade uh, the American states, New York state, they're going to send one army down from Montreal to New York. This is going to come in from the West. British and Indians, they were going to meet up with them. And they were going to divide the Americans and kind of end the American Revolution and reimpose British control. So they had this army coming in from the West, and I can show you where the West was, coming in from here, coming in from here to Rome. They're going to meet up Saratoga. They had this big battle. And they had this big battle in, in Rome at Fort Stanwix. I'm going to show you some pictures in a minute. And the Americans resisted and defeated the British there and the uh, Indian allies. And it was very important in saving the day and leading to American independence. So this was kind of a founding myth, if you will, of Rome, New York. Though Rome, New York in the 19th century became a major industrial city into the 20th century, this is what they always wanted to remember themselves is important for this big victory to defeat the British and secure American independence. So this is something they always want, and this is something by the 50s and 60s, you could see cities with the support of the federal government saying, yes, we think it's worth investing millions to celebrate this and revitalize your community. So here's a whole story. I'm going to go through this. I'm going to explain it in a minute. So here from the air is the way it looks today. There is this rebuilt reconstructed fort. The whole fort was lost. Um, it had been, there had been a fort there from about 1757. It had burned in 1781 at the end of the American Revolution, and it was never used. I mean, ba basically, there was a site there, but the fort was gone. And the city of Rome, New York, really developed right on top of this fort. So this was the center of the city, which had been as high as 50,000 people in 1960, and then today it's like 30, it's lost 20,000 people. And again, it's kind of an example of the rust belt and the decline of industry. It's not doing so well. So this was the center of town right here. So now I'm going to show you what they did and why they did it. So here they are. This is a reenactment, not on this site, but in Rome, New York in 1927, kind of the 150th anniversary of this battle. And they had... Oh, a Fort Stanwix scale model, one-third the size of the original. And here you can see, even back in the 1920s, they had people wearing the tricorn hats and the drums and the fifes and, you know, reenactment. They wanted to really celebrate it. So then as time goes on, see, it's the 1930s. The Depression is here. Cities are really struggling. There isn't a lot of economic development. They're looking to President Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal. Will you please invest in our community? So they get the idea, they get a, a national, what do you, I always forget, memorial and monument, monument created in the mid-1930s, but it really comes with no money at all. So they put up like a, a monument, a marker that says, this is a national monument, there's nothing to it. But after World War II, when there was some real urban renewal money, they come back and say, let's get some real money and we'll knock down the downtown and rebuild the historic fort where it was. So here I'm going to show you. Here, here, wait a minute, wait a minute. So here is the whole down, this is the core of this downtown of 50,000 people. Here it is, a whole urban area. They want to tear it down. They're going to tear down this part and put in a, fac, a facsimile fort, replica fort, and then this part here to kind of put in some new stores and buildings, new city hall. And here's an example, here's where they are. This is where the historic fort had been. And you can see kind of the streets that were here, the buildings that were here, and all these would be demolished to put in this historic fort. So here it is, 1960. So this is, and these plans are in the works for years and decades. These are a dream. There's somebody in the city 
There are people there who say, yes, we want to celebrate it. This is so important to us. Just as in Lawrence, it's the, it's the workers or the labor history. Here it's this American revolution. It's just amazing how you know, every city and town, as small as they can be, they all have something that they're really proud of that really kind of motivates them and keeps them going. Often they think people might come and spend lots of money there. It doesn't always happen, but it motivates people to be a greater and better community, to kind of learn from that and build upon those achievements. So here you are. Here's what was torn down. Here's Rome in 1970. And I'm going to show it to you here. This was all demolished. This is all demolished. Seven blocks, 70 buildings removed. And this is then what was by the late 1970s. So you say, oh, wow, that was real surgery. It's a cool place. Um, I do recommend, if you're ever in upstate New York, it's a nice interpretation, and it's, uh, it, it's a cool place. So here's what they demolished. This was all demolished. Wait a minute. Hit the wrong one. This was all demolished. This is here. This is a building. Here on the, the right-hand side, this is, this is all demolished for the fort, and this is all demolished for new commercial development, a parking garage. Because, of course, every downtown felt as if they needed a parking garage by the 1960s or 70s, if not more than one. And this was like, the, this is the downtown, up just a little bit beyond, they built a suburban style strip shopping center. Here it is, you can see all the parking, and this, is, this was, used to be a, a tight, walkable downtown. This is just beyond here, the fort would be over here. So an important thing, so I've kind of showed you maybe, you know, the bad and the ugly part, now I'm gonna show you maybe the better part. And this is what the National Park Service did. They tore this place down and then they said, well, we don't have a real plan uh, of what this fort looked like, because they built it back in the 1750s. You know, nobody left the real drawing or anything like that. So they did a real, very strong four years of archeological digging every year, and they dug up and they found all the foundations of the fort, and they said, okay, this was what the fort looked like. They said, we, here are the foundations, we're gonna build it exactly where it was, and we're going to recreate this fort, which is what they did, very professionally done. Here they are, the digging, they're showing students, and people are really excited in learning about this revolutionary era fort. And here they are, they're rebuilding it. This is the mid-70s, and as Jim said earlier, the bicentennial, you know, if you're younger, you don't know it, but. Uh, in the, the mid 1970s, it was, it was a big time to celebrate the American Revolution, American independence. And from uh, 1776, 1976, this battle was in 77, they wanted to recreate this and open it and celebrate. So here they are, they're building this, you know, this is a 19th century church, but they're rebuilding this fort right in the heart of town. And here it is here, and they think that this is going to be like Williamsburg, Virginia. They, they're going to have costume reenactors. People are going to really want to come here. And of course, at the time of the bicentennial in the 1970s, people were really excited about the revolution. And they have their highest attendance in the late 70s, and it's kind of trailed off ever since because people aren't as interested in the American Revolution. Maybe they will be. There's another anniversary coming up in the 20s, 2020s. So here we are. Here's the fort. And it's really a cool place. I recommend it if you're up there. And you know, they have reenactments in the summertime. You know, they'll bring in student groups and you know, they'll show them how to play the drums and how to carry these you know, fake guns and things like that. And then here, I'm just showing it to you from the air. Here's, you know, again, this is on the old town and here's the parking, all the parking, a lot of parking, a lot of roads. And this is where the, the gathering area is. They'll have a big concert there in the summertime, sometimes festivals. And this is where the real museum is where, you know, wintertime it isn't great to visit the fort, but here you can go in and you can see the whole story of what happened at that site. But then, I'm not gonna say a thing about this, except the idea is not to knock down the historic buildings, but to preserve them. And Lowell is really important, as Jim pointed out, people were thinking about it before 1978, was happening here in Lawrence, but to save the old buildings in rehab. That's a 1970s thing, before that it was like, yeah, knock it down, you know, who cares? Um, and then we'll build something that looks historic. But this is a, a major, major influential thing, not just for the National Park Service, the way we treat things, but 
um, communities across the country. I, I tell you, before the 1970s, nobody wanted to live in a vacant mill. And now it's cool, right? It's a nice space. Here you are. Here we are, boarding house, dining room. Um, so here are the lessons, the basic lessons of what I've got to say. Um, you know, the city drives it. Everybody thinks urban rules, federal money, yes. There were federal guidelines, yes. But it had to be the local community that really wanted it. And it took tenacious people and tenacious advocates and committees to advocate for a long period of time to get the resources and to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I wanted to point out, urban renewal doesn't necessarily apply wholesale demolition. That was kind of a thing maybe in the 50s, 60s, and into the 70s, but since then, not at all. Um, and some, I showed you in Providence, it didn't happen, though it could have. Um, and there was drastic demolition, but it was, sometimes it's for highways. The, the highway, when they built the highways, they didn't care about historic resources. The, the highway engineers, they were coming through and they wanted to build the widest, most accessible highways. City planners could always be convinced, maybe, to save historic buildings. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, there was this historic commemoration. It took on the Williamsburg Reconstruction. They went through reenactments. They didn't necessarily, you know, weren't always that authentic. They wanted it to kind of maybe, maybe look authentic, but it wasn't. Um, so it was kind of to celebrate this historic myth. Um, one thing about national parks, it has to be created by the Congress and or the president, it's usually both. Sometimes the president could do it on his own or her own, we'll see. Um, and then there's a, what's the difference between a national monument and a national memorial? The Fort Stanwix is a monument, so that could be a preservation or reconstruction. They called it a memorial in Providence because there was nothing to preserve. There was an, even to reconstruct. So they just kind of created a green space and commemorated it. What do I have? Let me, another minute or two. So the current national park philosophy of historic preservation is we don't reconstruct anymore. We don't do anything like Fort Stanwix. Um, we don't, re because we kind of show, show the archeology, span tell the story that was there, but we, we do not do that. Try to, don't try to get it through. Um, and we don't, well, first of all, we don't have many, we don't have much more funds in the state, so there's no money to do that anyways. <laughs> And then just, I, I just want to, to encourage everybody here. Um, I really am excited by this conference. I'm originally from Springfield, did city planning there. Uh, Springfield did a lot of urban renewal. But every medium and smaller city in the country got some money, was doing this sort of stuff in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. I'd love to see something, let's say for the Northeast, New England, New York State, to compare a bunch of places. The Lowell's, Lawrence, and Springfield's, the places I've talked about. Because to do the whole country, you, blow, you couldn't do it. You blow your mind. But let's say here's Chickabee Falls. Um, here it is. I, I went away to college in the early 70s, right? And this is the way Chickabee Falls looked when I went away to college. And then I came back one summer, it was like this. I said, oh, what happened to Chickabee Falls? And they thought it was going to be cool. It was going to, you know, it was going to come in and rebuild Chickabee Falls. But as we saw a slide earlier today, what did they have there? Maybe McDonald's, maybe a Jiffy Lube. And, that, and you know, instead of movie theaters and apartments and offices and all that stuff. So, but those stories are everywhere. And we should really, all of us, try to pull them together for whatever our community should be. Uh, here's the other New Haven. So that's basically my spiel. And if you have any comments or questions, I'd love to.